The following is a presentation of Surprise Church. El siguiente programa es la presentación de la iglesia Surprise. Amazing band with us. Holy cow. I feel like we could just dismiss and we'd be fine, but we won't do that. We'll still have church. Thanks again to all the volunteers who helped with the egg hunt. It was a great day. And I uh, uh, hope you're enjoying our herbal remedy, uh, legal herbal remedy of palm branches today. I remember when I was a kid thinking about our series called World Without Church, thinking back of my upbringing in the church, which I realize many of us didn't grow up. But my brother and I would steal as many palm branches as were left because we didn't think it was stealing because, I mean, they're going to die. So we just took all the ones that were left at the end of the church service and we would poke them in the belt of our pants and try to fly off the couch at home. And so I have all these memories of crashing down covered with palm branches because we tried to fly. And So kids, if anyone wants to try to be like me, you'll grow up like me. And maybe that's a good thing or a bad thing, but go ahead and try. I never could fly, but good luck to you if you, you do it. Uh, I also remember a Palm Sunday about 10 years ago at my last church where I served. We had the brilliant idea of bringing in a live donkey, which always goes well. And uh, the, the donkey came in the back and up the aisle, and all the kids were coming up and waving their branches. So just imagine what you saw except for a donkey in the middle of it. And of course, donkeys do what donkeys do. He just stopped where he was standing and just dropped a large crap right on the front of the stage on the floor. And of course, now you got kids singing with the band, but they're all kind of white, not step in anything while they're singing. And then, you know, the rest of the service, like, what do you do now? Do you just go on? Do you stop? Do you cancel church? Well, we kept going while this mound was just steaming there in front of everybody. Finally, they found a shovel that would do the job, and they shoveled it off, leaving this big dark circle on the ground. And it stayed there for weeks, even after we had it clean. So we had this vivid reminder of Palm Sunday right in front. The church has got this rich history for me of all kinds of interesting, goofy stories, because it's, it, what is this thing, you know? And having grown up in a rural community, uh, church looked very different than it does today. Uh, I had a big brick building and never imagined planting a church where we just rent space and then go be the church throughout the week. Others maybe had no background in the church. Others have a bad history with the church where the church is, is something that they have waved goodbye to uh, f a long time ago because of a, a negative experience. When the church gets it wrong, it's an ugly, ugly thing. People are shamed, excluded, hurt demeaned, guilted, bored, brushed aside, burned. But when the church gets it right, when we obey and honor the vivid dream of God in birthing this institution, the, the dream Jesus had in mind when he died to create this movement, when we get it right, it is the most beautiful thing you will see. Cities get changed, world gets changed. So today is our final installment of a series called World Without Church, where we acknowledge the role the church has in the world, talk about the ways that the church has not stepped up into that role, and the world has to live without a church, and then dream about what it would look like to fill that void as the church that Jesus intended. By the way, I haven't said this yet, in heaven, there is no church. There's not. There's no church. It says that in the Bible describing heaven. It says there's no temple there. Instead, you know what it says? It says, instead of having a church where you go, it says, everyone is holy, everywhere is holy, and everything is holy. And so as we, if we come into our, as we carry that three-dimensional version of what this is into the world, we're making it more like the world it's going to be in the end. So we're bringing heaven here. Last couple of weeks, we've been talking about a prisoner, a Christian prisoner in Indonesia named Abraham Ben Moses, who was a Muslim studying the Christian faith who became so captivated with the Jesus he was studying to try to reject that he, Jesus became a real person. And I don't know if that's happened to you yet. Many of us, Jesus has an idea to either agree with or disagree with, no, not no. But for Abraham, as he studied to reject the Christian faith, he discovered a real person with a face. And he fell in love with this man to the point where he was willing to do some very dangerous things in a culture that was not friendly to the Christian faith to start sharing the one he loves. And in many Muslim cultures, wonderful people, um, many, many, many good Muslim people, but in many cultures, 
it's a real no-no to switch to a Christian faith. His wife left him, and he was arrested after trying to share Jesus in an organized way, and he's now been in prison over 105 or 110 days. We wrote a letter to, to this man, just encouraging him, through an organization that identifies and gives updates about prisoners. There's many, many prisoners around the world that, you know, we're doing things that we just take for granted in this country and get arrested for it, imprisoned for it, and oftentimes executed for it. And we were the 307th, 27th letter that were sent to him in prison, praying for him, um, praying for his captors to, to see the light. And we do this because... In our culture, complacency can take hold so greatly. Abraham ben Moses was told, you may not follow Jesus, share Jesus, gather with Christians, and he did anyway. In our culture, we don't hear that voice. We hear, you don't have to. We hear, look at all the things you could do instead. And sometimes we do very well to hear the stories of people who are told, you may not. To say, well, what if I were told that? How then would I live with, if I recognize the sacred privilege that many believers around the world do not have? Would I be so complacent? Would I see worshiping with other believers as this rich privilege that I do not deserve? That many people risk their lives whispering in a basement to not get caught doing all over the world. How do we best pray for them and honor them by not taking those privileges for granted here? Speaking of that, I want to challenge you to do something that I've not asked people to do during my sermons before on their smartphones, and that is uh, you shared the event for Easter during announcements. I want to challenge you to open that back up again, and during the course of my sermon, and again, I'm not going to take it an insult if you're on your phones, I want to challenge you to do something that complacent people don't do. That is invite people to celebrate the greatest news the world has ever heard with us on Easter. It's the best time of the world. It's it's as good or even better than Christmas to encourage someone to join us. Because it's just a time of year where people just expect to go to church. They just do. And I'm going to be informing you why that is the most loving thing you can possibly do. So if you're not sure about it, just invite them. Don't hit send. Wait until the end if you're not sure about it. Um, But I'm going to be sharing over the course of the sermon why you're welcoming someone to consider being a part of this movement. Because you're a person they trust and might consider connecting with us if, if someone they trust invites them and recommends it. I'm going to be sharing with you why that is the most loving thing you could do, the most humble thing you could do, and why it's a sacred privilege that many are in prison for doing. So I will not be insulted if I see smartphones open. I encourage you to do it. I ask you to do it. Easter is not for us. We celebrate Easter for the world. Just like we don't do church for us, we do church for the world. And so it's a chance for us to remind ourselves of that as we stubbornly say, I'm not just going to think about when I want to go to services. For me, I'm thinking about how I can make this a party for lost sons and daughters who may want to come home and celebrate with us. So thank you for doing that in advance. Now let me tell you why that matters so much. Palm Sunday was not called Palm Sunday when Jesus got out of bed that morning and said, hey, it's Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is what we called it afterward for what happened in Luke 19, and all four of the Gospels describe it a little bit differently, but they all kind of have different camera angles on the same day when Jesus, it's called his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, knowing he's going to die. He went there specifically in order to die, and therefore, knowing that every single step he takes is significant, full of meaning and purpose. And uh, intended to say that what has been written about the one who God would send to save the world, the Messiah, in the scriptures of old, he did things to directly fulfill those promises. Every step he takes is significant. Every word he speaks is significant. And including, go and get me that donkey, that colt, and I'm going to ride it into town. He could have walked, but he didn't because there was a promise that the Messiah would come humbly riding on a donkey. They brought it to Jesus. They threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. And he went along. People spread their cloaks on the road. I mean, imagine taking your cloak, which is the most expensive thing that many people owned, their cloak. And when Jesus comes, you spread this cloak on the dirty road while a donkey rides over top of it. That's how you would welcome a king. That's how you would welcome a dignitary, royalty, visiting your city. They're welcoming Jesus this way. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, you can still stand there today. I have had friends who've gone there to celebrate Palm Sunday and walked with people from all over the world. Today, it's surprised we had people from Africa, China, um, Brazil, 
Uh, any other countries here today? Mandan, Taiwan? <laughs> Either way? <laughs> okay. Uh, we've had people from all around the world here today, and that's what Palm Sunday is like in Jerusalem. If you go there, you're going to see people from all over the world walking, retracing Jesus' steps with palm branches into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to joyfully praise God in a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. Listen to what they say. To Jesus, riding over their cloaks on the road like a king. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven. Peace in heaven. We're going to come back to that. And glory in the highest. They're quoting us as... as Psalm 118, a messianic psalm that promises that there's going to be a day when the, this one comes. Jesus steps into this role as the fulfiller of God's promises of old. Now, when Jesus is being proclaimed loudly as a king in the capital city of, Jer of Jerusalem, a city occupied by Rome with soldiers all around, who expect people to be loyal to the emperor, the king of Rome, that's dangerous. That's the kind of thing that will get you killed. The Pharisees, the religious leaders of the Jewish people, kind of had this weird in-between role trying to make sure that they could cozy up to the Romans and, and still cozy up to their own people and play the role of making sure that they don't get destroyed and annihilated for rebelling. So they had this weird keep the peace kind of role. And the Pharisees also were very jealous of Jesus because he was popular in a way that they were not. He drew followers even though he didn't have their pedigree. <clears throat> and so when they see him being proclaimed king, they're jealous, but they're also fearful that the Roman soldiers will take their swords out and put down a rebellion to make sure that they don't try to adopt a new king. So the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. This has gone too far. Tell them to stop calling you a king. You're going to get us all killed. Now listen to what Jesus says. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. That's humbling for me. If I'm not preaching, somebody else will. If I'm not a pastor, someone else will pastor. If I don't follow Jesus and serve him, somebody else will. God doesn't need me any more than he needs you. When we recruit volunteers at Surprise, when we challenge people to give, we never say we need this we don't. God doesn't need anything. If you want to serve, if you want to be on a volunteer team, if you want to give and support our mission, do it because you're lucky and you get to, or don't do it at all. Do it because you're joyful about it or don't do it at all. We, we do a Joy 10 tithing challenge where people who want to practice the model of biblical tithing, the 10% of your income to the local house of God so that we can transform our community with it, we say, you are only allowed to do this if it's out of joy, not guilt. You cannot do it if you're guilty about doing it. Only do it if you get to. And we'll help you. We have a give back or we'll give you your money back if it doesn't go well. You know, if we'll give it to another church if you don't trust us. It's about you doing that sacred privilege that Christians get to do, give back to their God who gave us everything in the first place. And so God doesn't need me. This movement, this church, if every single Christian in the world decided they'd rather go hang out and camping instead of worshiping, you know what you would hear? You'd hear rocks rattling, vibrating worship. It's going to happen. Jesus is like a steamroller. It's going forward no matter what. If we want to be a part of it, we're taking advantage of a privilege that we don't deserve and are not needed to, but get to participate in. As they approached Jerusalem and saw the city, now you think Jesus would be celebrating at this point because he's got this awesome pep rally. My hometown high school went to the Twin Cities for the state tournament in Minnesota last week, and they had a whole caravan of cars driving with them, fire engines, whatever, leaving town. There was a big pep fest, and they all left town. Jesus had his big pep fest. Watch what he does next. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept. Some send off. He wept over it and he said, If you, Jerusalem, if you only knew, if even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, the 
but now it's hidden from your eyes. Remember, interestingly, what the crowd said when they greeted him? Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven. Jesus is trying to bring that peace to earth. We are trying to bring that peace to Bismarck. And he says, if you only understood what would bring peace, I came to bring heaven's peace to earth. Because right now there's peace in heaven, not earth. And if you'd understand that that's me, that's my mission, and that's my movement, things would be different for you. But now it's hidden from your eyes. This steamroller that Jesus is driving straight through Jerusalem that's going to culminate with his death and the resurrection, spawning a movement that's going to transform the world, this thing is meant to bring peace to a world that is lacking peace. People who cannot see what he has to offer need to see it in us if they're going to see it at all. He doesn't need us, but he can use us. Jesus was starting an unstoppable movement that would bring peace to blinded souls. So we do not try to grow our church to feel better about ourselves. We want to reach more people with the message that brings people heaven's peace. And as we said in past weeks, we have the keys to unlock those doors that God just says, here you go, use them. Use them or lose them. Now again, as you're inviting folks on your Facebook pages, you can also check out the bulletin insert where you're taking sermon notes. I made a little block, a little box on the front page where you can write down the names of anybody that God puts in your mind during the sermon, this sermon who needs peace. I don't care how old they are. I don't care what they're struggling with. I don't care how far out of bounds they seem. Write their name down. If God puts anybody's name in your mind to pray for or invite to join this movement, just write them down and just trust God to take you the next step. Don't forget those names. Don't forget those faces. God doesn't. If anybody needs peace, write them down and plug that name in on Facebook and invite them. As you're doing that, I want to explain what happened in the next three centuries after Jesus' death and resurrection that took Christianity to a small band of ragtag, uneducated fishermen and followers of Jesus to the dominant religion in the Roman Empire. This is shocking. Buckle up for this. This is so cool. Number one, Christianity, as we talked about today, has people from all around the world. Christianity had this multiracial attraction where people, like, they finally, it didn't matter what race you are. I mean, we're struggling with different, different levels of racism today. It has nothing to has no resemblance to the kind of racism that the world history has known, where wars were fought based on your DNA, where your class, your status, was purely set by your DNA. And all of a sudden, these Christians come along, and they, keep, they say things like, there is no longer Jew or Gentile. Don't you dare. Some of the early Christian leaders got bawled out for refusing to eat dinner for racist reasons with people who were not their race. Christianity takes racism, grabs it by the throat, and says, the heck with you. There is no longer boundaries between races because Jesus Christ has made us one. That was revolutionary. Absolutely revolutionary. Also, human history has been very cruel to women in many, many, many different ways places. Often just the physical stature differences between men and women have created a culture in which the strong survive, a pure Darwinianism. Women have had a disadvantage in many cultural constructs throughout history. And when the Christian church came along, women were drawn to it because they found a level of respect and dignity and protection they had never, ever seen. Even in recent decades, in, in, a, in, a, in a countries like China, where there had a limit to the number of children you can have, many women were either aborted or, or abandoned as infants because that represented a male you could have who could work and labor for you and then hopefully be your retirement plan of taking care of you when you retire. And so girls in that culture were not seen as valuable because they were limited in the number of kids they could have and they were treated as worthless. That's in modern day history. Women saw the church and were drawn to it because they were found precious, they were protected, and they were respected in unthinkable ways up to that point. And they married people who didn't know Jesus, who fell in love with Jesus by their patient, caring witness, and the church exploded because of just this high birth rate. And even better, when plagues came and some of the famous plagues that we read about in European history 
when those plagues hit, people who were not followers of Jesus ran. When someone they loved got sick, they ran. Christians were not afraid. They believed in a God who raises the dead. And so they cared for their sick. And the survival rates for Christians were incredibly high compared to those who didn't know follow Jesus. They joined the church at that time because of the care they would receive, and the people in the church uh, survived at a much higher rate so that during times of plagues and natural disasters, the church's numbers exploded because so many other people died. They weren't getting cared for because they weren't a part of this amazing community. And they joined because they wanted to be a part of this amazing community. And at the same time, they had martyrs, people who were willing to give their lives for the faith, people who were put on trial and threatened that gladly said, I am not going to abandon Jesus. He'll take me home the moment you kill me. You can't kill my soul. You can kill my body all you want. And instead of scaring people away, that drew people like, if that is how courageous this Jesus makes you, I'm in. So instead of stamping down the movement, it exploded the, the movement. I, I visited in Guatemala, uh, a, a city on um, Lake Atitlan in the high mountains of Guatemala, and there was a priest there that was murdered in the 80s during the, the period of violence in the 1980s in Guatemala. And uh, a priest currently working there said, martyr's blood is a seed of many Christians that has spawned a movement of the church like nothing else could. And people recognize that this man's faith was that real. That's just the first few centuries. Another book written by Oz Guinness, good name for St. Patrick's Day, uh, The Renaissance, The Power of the Gospel, However Dark the Times, talks about the world transformation caused by the Christian church in ways that if the church did not exist, if the movement Jesus created did not exist, I do not, I honestly do believe, do not believe that human race would still exist. I really don't. And if it did, it would be so completely different, we would not even recognize it. And I'm going to go through six quick ways, if you're tracking along in your sermon notes. This is like, like high-level grad school class real fast here. So track with me if you want to, or just let it wash over you. But again, this is why what you're doing on your smartphones right now, inviting, this is the movement you're inviting them to be a part of. This is a big deal. Number one, communication would have been so different if it weren't for the Christian movement. Uh, Christians had this call from Jesus to spread the gospel to the far corners of the world. And so they took great risks and many times gave their lives to help bring the gospel to these places. But when they got there, they realized that many of the languages didn't have a written language. And so they would train people how to write their own native language. So they helped provide written language for people all over the world so that then they could translate the Bible into that written language which could then help their culture. But they, their culture was able to advance and adapt to this changing world by becoming literate by missionaries who would make their language in written form. Once translated into those languages, the Bible also reshaped their languages because it gave them a whole new vocabulary for love, peace, and justice that they didn't have before. So it created language and it adapted and enhanced their language to include Christian values that transformed cultures from the inside out. And it spread literacy to remote places. Philanthropy was unprecedented in the Christian church. It's, there's never been such a force for good than in the Christian church. I'm not saying the Christian church hasn't caused bad, too. There's been many, many decayed, fossilized, broken movements that have spawned out of in the name of Jesus. No, no question about that. That's true of any movement. But when he got it right, it was a force for good like nothing else. In the fourth century, Christians started the first hospice and hospitals during a famine. I just talked to a man who's a mortician between service. Oh, yeah. Like, we studied this in... Mortician school, or whatever they call it. Yeah, like, that's Christians were on the front line of giving honor to people in the times of death, caring for the dead of society. Christians were the ones that would bury the society's dead. No one else knew what to do. Everyone else was afraid to go near the dead body. They started hospice units so that people during a famine could die in dignity. They were hospitals that were started so they could be cared for in, in their times of need. These were Christians on the front lines of reorganizing society around care. Again, Christians cared for the sick in times of plagues and trials where everyone else was afraid. They believed in the God who raised the dead and it changed everything. Philanthropy would not look the same in human history without the movement Jesus died to start. Reform movements would not have happened without the Christian movement. Christian reformers throughout history willingly gave their lives, sometimes in death and sometimes just their entire lives, for the cause of justice. Slavery ended, at least in its um, 18th century, 19th century institutional form, ended 
because Christians like William Wilberforce were willing to go against the grain, like Martin Luther King were willing to go against the grain. Now, we know that today there are more slaves than at any time in human history due to human trafficking, and we're going to talk a lot about that on Easter, Wednesday, and Sunday with Brandy, who's here from Invisible Innocence. Everybody say hi, Brandy. She's awesome. She's going to talk a little bit about how Invisible Innocence is helping to uh, bless survivors of human trafficking, and, and uh, God, the, this movement is still underway. There is still a lot of work to be done. But throughout history, we see uh, Christians stepping forward and doing amazing things in the, in the name of Jesus to reform the brokenness and injustice of society, and they gave their lives for it. There's a pastor in Nazi Germany that wasn't, wasn't afraid of Adolf Hitler, and he participated in an assassination plot at the cost of his own life to get rid of Hitler. Christians founded major universities. You didn't know, did you know this? Think of all those Ivy League schools we think are where all the smart people go. I applied to Yale. I did. I wanted to go play basketball there. They, I think they would have let me in if I'd have been willing to write the check, but I wasn't. <laughs> Harvard, Yale, Princeton, started by clergy, run by Christians. Became very secularized in the last century, but that's their roots. This very intensely Christian who said, we want to create opportunities in this land for people to grow and learn and preserve knowledge. Modern science would not look the same were it not for Christian scientists who are willing to go against the grain. This is oftentimes the backward way we look at it. Christians are oftentimes seen as the, the backwater people who are holding science back. Not the case at all. The, the, many of the medieval uh, and pre-modern modern discoveries were by Christians who were not afraid to let the truth be the truth about how the world works and how the universe works. They led science out of the dark ages. Even atheistic scientists have to attribute the contributions throughout history of Christians. You watch the documentary Cosmos by Neil deGrasse, an atheist himself, but he, the whole darn thing is this Christian and then this Christian and then this Christian and then this Christian did this, 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 and this. And that's why we know what we know. It's crazy. Everybody has to acknowledge that Christians brought science out of the dark ages added care and compassion and Christian values to Greek, ancient Greek thought and helped organize things that had never existed before, like capitalism, technology, and medicine, and government. That's modern science. Would be totally different. May not exist. Human rights revolution started when Christians said, wait a minute. We believe that every human being is made in the image of God, and if that's true, that has to change how we treat human beings in our cultures. It's a revolutionary belief to believe that looking at every single person in this room as just as valuable as the next person. Instead of kings having the divine right to rule because they're somehow an elevated status, everyone's a king. Everyone has inherent value. So when Thomas Jefferson penned the Declaration of Independence, it was saturated with Judeo-Christian value. We believe that these truths are self-evident, that all men, all humans are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable life, rights. That's saturated with an understanding of the worth of every human soul. And that notion was revolutionary. It was the foundation of representative government and it was the foundation of the church-state separation. The church and state separation was not the government saying, okay, we're sick of the church trying to control us. It was the church saying, we are sick of governments using God to justify their purposes. We need a separation between church and state so that the government does not try to do the work of the church and so that the church doesn't try to do the work of the government. Those are two different vocations, two different kingdoms. One, to dispense justice and build a more trustworthy world, and one, to dispense the gospel and build a more faithful world. The two work together, they're not opposed to one another. Now, these, all these six things, all these six things are the public things that you can read about in the history books. No one can disagree with them. They're, 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 they're indisputable facts of how the world currently works because of the movement that Jesus died to create. Indisputable historical fact. But I'm here to tell you that the greatest impact of this movement was not the things that you could read about in history books or in the news. It's the unseen kingdom, the stuff that nobody knows about, that subtly and quietly transforms families and neighborhoods and marriages and um, police forces and corrupt governments. 
this is, the, the things we just listed up to this, this point is just the tip of the iceberg of the huge beneath the surface operation of this movement in real time around the world. I just brainstormed a quick list of things that the church just does because it is. You think of couples getting together with friends of theirs that are struggling and praying for their marriage? It doesn't make the news. It, tra- it protects and saves families and marriages. It doesn't make the news. It doesn't make the history books. You think of the number of people who are being walked by the hand and prayed for by groups of people to protect them from addiction. It doesn't make the headlines. Nobody knows about it. Nobody sees it. It's confidential. You think of people going into hospital rooms and praying for the sick. You think of people um, in nursing homes with Alzheimer's getting sung to so that they can sing the songs they learned as, as kids in their school and remember at least something from their lives to feel whole just for that moment. You think of people at getting funeral care that, 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 that have died and, and their families are now gathered around and here's hearing good news Teenagers getting nurtured as they try to figure out and sort out what their identity is and getting help to sort that, that, that their identity is in Jesus, not in some worldly category. You think of neighborhoods getting cleaned up, corruption getting challenged, people getting purpose, encouragement getting given, peace getting found, souls getting saved, people getting helped, slaves getting set free. These things don't make the headlines. People do them and many times can't talk about them because the place they're doing them, if they knew that they were doing them, they would be arrested. The kingdom of God is in secret. It's like yeast, Jesus says, making the dough expand from the inside. It's like a tiny little seed that eventually grows into this huge tree for birds to make their nests in it. You know what I think about heaven? And I think this is true. As I invite the man back up, heaven is going to have beautiful nature. It's going to have cities and streets of gold and all that stuff. And the Bible doesn't say this, but I'm pretty darn sure that in heaven, there is going to be a large jumbotron. That's what I said. My kids believe that there are screens in heaven, and I think they're right. And on those screens is going to be an endless, nonstop highlight reel of all the never-before-seen acts of Christian heroism that have prompted those tip-of-the-iceberg historical events, but from the bottom up as people quietly, gently expand this kingdom and bring light to dark places for no praise, for no applause, for no rewards, for no accolades, but just because they follow the Son of God. You're going to be able to sit there and stand there and just watch the the family films of the, the movement of Jesus and just be blown away anytime you want when you see people in Indonesia and China and Pakistan and Brazil in Mandan, in Bismarck, all around the world doing things for Jesus that no one's ever seen before that just demonstrate this fearless love. Women have oftentimes not been cherished as God cherishes them in human history until they found themselves a part of the Christian movement. As we said, in China, women were abandoned at birth or aborted because they weren't boys and they, they needed boys to fit their retirement plan and, and, and the minimum number or maximum number of children you could have. But let me tell you right now, in China, 60% of the house churches, the churches that are being hidden in secret and growing in people's living rooms, are led by teenage girls. Somebody say amen. Come on. 60% of brand new churches in China are led by by teenage girls, and you don't think God can use you. You're not sure if you have what it takes. You wonder if your past can prevent that future. You're not sure if you have the time. I'm here to tell you that God loves doing stuff like that to show all of us a different future than we can imagine for ourselves. You are a part of the Jesus movement. There's no one that's saying to you, you may not. What are you saying to yourself? Are you saying, I will? Are you saying, I am? Can you envision yourself as his beloved child yet? If that's not your story to the past, I believe it is the story of your future. That today is the day that that if you've never embraced Jesus as the God who gives everything on the cross to win you back and call you his son, call you his daughter, today's the day. 
before you leave this place, come and pray with somebody and say, I want in. And then for the rest of us who maybe said that that is who I am, I want to challenge you to fight against that complacency that other people, Christians around the world just don't have the option of. And recognize from how you invite to how you live. Each and every moment we get to call ourselves as followers is an unbelievable privilege that has transformed the world in ways that we cannot even imagine. The world may not even be here if Christians like you had not been willing to step up and bring light to dark places. And the world doesn't need us, but depends on people to carry forth that message in the future to make sure that more people live lives with peace. Would you stand and pray with me and claim that as we sing this last song? Heavenly Father, we praise you that we are part, whether we want to be or not, we are part of the world that has been redeemed through the death of Jesus, that people have been sent to bring hope and light and that light is still shining. That, that, those reforms, those movements, those acts, that liberation, we are seeing the echo of the cross every single day all around us. And yet there is so, so, so much work to be done. There is so, so much more peace to bring. And that's why there are, are new generations of believers being risen up to make that peace known. Father in heaven, I pray that we would be a courageous generation, that we would not fall sadly into complacency when it comes to faith in Christ, that we would not miss out on our destiny to share our faith in Christ, that the people in our lives would not miss an opportunity to see the, the, the peace through us and in us and to be invited to participate in the movement that Jesus died to create. Make the world different because we weren't afraid. Bring hope because we weren't afraid. And as we sing this last song, God, continue giving us visions and images of people that are, that are precisely placed in our lives because we can play the role of your ambassadors. In Jesus' name, all God's saints said.